pastor, he says, Brother, we ought to do that. You propose we do that? We don't have the provisions for it. We don't have the bread. We don't have the grape juice. or the things that's required for the Lord's Supper. He says, don't worry about it. I got it all taken care of. You just come back to my room. He said, well, the Russians are watching us. You don't think that they're going to know what we're doing. They don't like Christians. They put us all here in a concentration camp together. They said, don't worry about it. We'll just sit over here in a dark corner here. Uh, they'll think we're just having tea together, fellowshipping, and, and they won't bother us at all. I've already thought this through. He said, all right, we'll do it then. So he got down and he ministered the Lord's Supper, and, and it was the biggest blessing that they've ever had. I mean, they went out rejoicing and praising the Lord. Now, I don't agree with the, the Lutheran doctrine on, on, on the Lord's Supper. That's not what I'm saying here, but for them, it was the most special thing that they could do Remembering the Lord's death until He comes. And this is very special. I mean, if, if somebody who's locked away in a concentration camp and they receive a little bit of provision, it's all they have. And, and uh, it could have been their supper or their dinner or something for the next day. And the first thing that he thinks about is, we ought to have the Lord's Supper. It ought to be special to us too. That's the point that I want to get across. Uh, it was a dirty room. The pastor was in rags and these things. And yet, all they could think about was the presence of the Lord. Uh, when we go all over America, especially Washington, D.C., and all these areas, we can look up and we can see the Washington Memorial. And it's to commemorate our president, our first president, and what he stood for and the freedoms that he helped procure for our country fighting. I mean, you don't see a president of the United States going out to war anymore. And fighting for the country and the things they did to, to declare our independence from, from England and these things, we got a memorial erected for him. You go over to the Lincoln Memorial, you see a big statue of Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation of Proclamation and all that's written in there in stone and, and we commemorate uh, what Abraham Lincoln has done here in America. And, and people go over there and they, and, and they praise it all the time and they say, oh, what a great president Abraham Lincoln was. Well, he was. But he's nothing like what my Savior is. Amen. You can go to the Vietnam memorials. You can go to the World War II memorials. You can go to the Holocaust to commemorate what has happened there. But this is something more special than all of that. And so here is, we're meant to, 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 to commemorate our Lord who is not dead. Just like the, when I know our soldiers served in Vietnam and they served in World War II and and they've de died and they've gone on, but yet our Lord is still living and He's still going on. We're celebrating it until He comes. And so this rises above all the other memorials that we can never think of. When we come around to the Lord's table, we come to a memorial of a dying Christ and we find ourselves suddenly confronted with what? A living Christ. It's not that, you know, He did die, He, we, he did die on the cross for our sins, but He didn't stay there. He's now a, a living, risen Savior, as I preached about this morning. And it's like a great bridge that spans the church history. And on the un one end, it, it rests on the shame of the cross, and on the other end, as Christ, the hope of glory, who will return one day. Someone said here that the Lord's Supper is a table of communion. You see that over in 1 Corinthians 10.16. It's a table of communion. He says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ and the bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And so it's a, a table of communion, not as the, the Roman Catholics would think of it. Communion just means a fellowship. When we all sit together as brothers and sisters in Christ and we come together and remember what the Lord has done for every one of us, cleansing us from our sins, washing away our sins with the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and He was that pure, unleavened bread without any sin whatsoever. And we partake of that broken bread for us. It's a table of communion. It's a table of remembrance. Verse 24, it says, uh, of chapter 11, He says, This do in remembrance of Me. It's not to come here for anybody else, but we're doing it in remembrance of our Lord. Not remembrance of a former pastor or uh, somebody you love. It's a, in, in remembrance of the Lord, a table of remembrance. It's a table of obedience. He says, take and eat 
and drink this cup there in verses 24 down through 26. He gives us a command. He says, when, when the Lord brought the disciples together, what did He do? He served them. They say, here, this is the bread that represent my body that will be broken for you. Take and eat this cup, this grape juice, this unfermented grape juice that we partake of. This is my blood that will be spilled for you. Take and eat. Drink of this cup and do it as often uh, as you will till the Lord comes. It's a table of confession in verse 26. It tells us, For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until He comes. And so when we partake of the Lord's Supper, it's a confession of what God has already done in our hearts. It's a confession of what we believe that the Lord has done on our behalf. It's a table of uh, confession. You do show the Lord's death. The whole world sees it. It's a table of expectation. Verse 26, it says, Until till He comes. And we know that the Lord is coming. Over and over again within the Scriptures, we believe in the pre-millennial rapture. The Lord is going to save us from the wrath that it is to come. And He's coming one day. He's going to catch away His bride in the clouds and receive us unto Himself that where He is there we may be also. So there's an expectation there of the Lord coming. And then it's a table of examination in verse 28. He says, let a man examine himself. That doesn't mean look at somebody else and say, man, you see that person over there, they're eating and drinking and shame on them. They're eating and drinking. And you're not supposed to judge your brother, your sister in Christ. You're only to examine yourself. That's on them. Between them and the Lord, it's a self-examination that takes place there. And so my proposition, the Lord's Supper must not be taken in vain. It must not be taken lightly. We must not make light of it. It's something that's special. And so the purpose here. There are many forms and ceremonies in, in Israel's day. We can go to the book of Leviticus and Numbers and all these things. You see all the feasts that they would bring in, all the sacrifices they would do. Three times a year they would appear before the temple and offer this sacrifice and that sacrifice and this feast and that feast, seven feasts throughout the whole year. But we only have one feast that's given to the church and that's the Lord's Supper. Yeah, there's two ordinances. We know that the first ordinance is what? Baptism. That's done once. When a person is saved and they've given their life to Jesus Christ and, and, and we part, show that picture of the, of the Lord of what He's done in our hearts that we are buried with. We died with Him. We're buried with Him in the likeness of His death and raised again to walk in newness of life. And so we've given up that new, old life because we've been made a new creature in Christ. That's what baptism represents. But the Lord's Supper... It's something that's ongoing. He says, as often as you partake of this cup. It doesn't give a time frame there. We'll go into that here in a little bit. So the Lord's Supper is the only phys physical, visible ordinance celebrated by the church in its corporate capacity, which means we all come together. We're meeting together in Christian fellowship, and therefore it's of the most vital importance. Is a witness to the world, a witness that men can see of the Christian unity of the members... We're, we're, we're in unity together, right? We ought to be in unity and brotherly love and kindness one toward another, lifting up and partaking and showing Christ one to another. Uh, it's that unity of Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. The fact that the church is His body. And when I look at that unleavened bread there and uh, of the Lord's, uh, that shows the Lord's uh, death to His body that was breaking for me... Um, the, the bread is the body. And we're the body of Christ. We're also to be unleavened without sin cleansed when we partake. And so it's also primarily so the one physical, visible reminder that Christ died and that He shed His precious blood for the salvation of souls. Uh, we give the Corinthian church a hard time, don't we? We say, man, who, who would accept that kind of church? Who would go to that church? They were a mess. I mean, they were saying, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos and all these, I'm serving this guy and this is the guy that I follow and on and on and on. Now we can go through the list again 
of all the, the things that they had wrong with them. And when we come to the Lord's Supper, we, we, we get to the fact that they just made a, a great big feast out of things. Every time they come together, they said, man, we got to have some steak, some deer steak, and some, uh, we got to have some potatoes, and we got to have all these things. We got to have the grape juice. And, and man, they made a big ordeal about it, just sort of like when we have Baptist fellowships coming together. I mean, we, we have a big to-do. Uh, the fellowships, the meals, the aromas, and all these. We even cut our services short in order for the fellowship, right? Uh, we ought not to make more about a Christian fellowship than we do about the Lord's Supper. And so we can't give the Corinthian church a hard time if we're not... if we have some of the same troubles ourselves. I mean, we... we're, we're just something else. We're a mess sometimes. The Baptists have a name for breaking bread and keeping the chicken population down, but neither uh, did the Corinthian church. They loved to eat so much that they were selfish about it, and they just thought of the Lord's Supper as another meal. And it would be a sad day to see our fellowship meals take over the Lord's Supper. And the Lord said, do this in remembrance of me. In Victory Baptist Church, uh, the church that me and Dr. Spencer, I was a deacon there at the church, we had a man there who started the church. His name was Pastor Henry Nichols. Man, I don't think you would find a greater man. He was a humble man. And just whenever he preached and whenever he taught, I mean, it's sort of like he brought everything like J. Vernon McGee down onto the bottom shelf so everybody can understand it. And this guy, I looked up to him. I admired him. And Sarah says uh, when she came to, to Ambassador Baptist College, she went to that church, and that was the same time that he stepped down from the pastorate. He had a brain tumor that, that it kind of affected his ability to preach as he should have. And uh, he couldn't think as clearly as what he wanted to. And they told him that you're probably going to die within a year. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's right. They said, you know, you're probably going to die. So he stepped down humbly as he knew how, and he still was uh, faithful within the church. I don't think you would find a better brother, a godlier man in Christ than this guy. Not to lift up man. But I'm saying, you, I mean, we ought to honor our, our people who, who, who love Christ. And, and so he was a faithful pastor in the church. And over the time, you know, he would try to, during homecomings and stuff, he would preach and he would uh, just give a devotion whenever he, he was required to, whenever they let him give a devotion. And, and so he was faithful at the church. And then when the new pastor came in here about a year ago, uh, Pastor Reese they, they dedicated the fellowship hall to him. It's called Nichols Hall. And so when everybody would go into Nichols Hall, they would remember a pastor who, who got his hands dirty, his blood and sweat tears who were poured in because he helped build the church with his own hands. He helped do the electrical work. He helped put in the baptistry. He, he did all of that. He helped keep the, the finances in order. And, and so he was responsible. And, and people love him even to this day. And so when they go into that fellowship hall, they remember the pastor who started that church and his faithfulness and his love to all the people within the church. And when I became pastor over at Miracle Baptist Church, uh, he wasn't a pastor anymore. He gave me all of his commentaries and all of his books and these things. And so <laughs> I get to look into him from time to time and I'll look at his notes that he put in there. And what a blessing to me to remember a man who's been faithful all these years and the things that he's done to, to help a young pastor like me. To help a church to go closer to Christ. And that's what it's all about. You know, and so when we come here, I remember a Savior who's, who's cleansed me. Who's set my feet on solid ground. Who's given me a new life. I'm here to remember a Savior, not a person. Well, the Savior is a person. But you know what I'm saying. So I'm here to remember our Lord when we partake of the Lord's Supper. We ought to be reminded of the one who instituted it, commanded that we do it, and what it represents. And then as participants, since the Lord's Supper was given by the Lord to the church, we, we've seen Him when, when He brought in the twelve disciples. He says, I want you to go and prepare a place for us uh, into an upper room. And they went up there and, and they sent... I don't know if I would have sent Peter, but they probably sent Peter and John over there to procure a room and, and order it and set it up and these things. And, and they brought in with the twelve disciples and they gathered around preparing for that, that, that meal that they would have together. And we would say that uh, 
the Lord's Supper is open for those of like faith and practice, I do believe that's right. Uh, some people will just go close communion and they say, well, I'm only going to open it up for just the members of this church and this church only. I believe that if they're a brother and sister in Christ, that they've accepted uh, the Lord and Savior the same way that you and me did, that they, they, they claim to the same truths that we do as an independent, fundamental Baptist church, then we ought to allow them to come in and partake of the Lord's Supper. As long as, long as they're in right standing with their church. If somebody's going to cause a division in somebody else's church, and they want to come here and partake of the Lord's Supper, well, we're not going to have that, brother. Uh, they got to be in right standing and in right with the Lord in order to partake of the Lord's Supper. And so, that's the participants there. John 13, we find uh, when the Lord came and He's ordering the, the foot washing, sir. He gets down on His hands and knees, girds Himself with a towel. He's there cleansing the disciples' feet and their hands. And He's getting them ready for, the, for the, the Lord's Supper. He's washing them all over. And then He tells them, He says, the one who I dipped the sop into the water, that's the one who's going to betray Me. And we all were, were, were quick. Where, where does Judas come into place? Judas was there at that, that Lord's Supper, wasn't he? No, he wasn't. He was there for the foot washing service. He was there to, to partake of that, but as soon as that water, as soon as he dipped that sop in that water and he reached down his hands in that water with the Lord, he said, Satan filled him and he left immediately. He says, what you do, go, go and do immediately. And so he left. They all thought that he was going out and he was buying something that they were lacking, maybe more bread or maybe more... Five... I help if I get in the right chapter here. It says, And then Jesus, Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he answered him and said, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. And that's when he begins to institute the Lord's Supper. But continuing on who is the participants here, uh, I believe that anybody who's in the body of, of Christ, a member of His church, these are the ones who are the participants. Go over to Matthew 28, just a few pages over. Verses 19 and 20. I believe we have an order here. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Didn't the Lord teach them to observe the Lord's Supper? All things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Acts chapter 2, if you would. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. It says, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized, and the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and prayers. And so they were saved, they were baptized, they were members of the church, and they were partaking of the the bread. Now, it doesn't say the Lord's Supper there, does it? It just says they were breaking bread. There was a fellowship there. Uh, but I believe that there's an order of being saved and baptized uh, before you partake there. So, it represents those who are unleavened and in unity and are partakers of the body of Christ. And then the time there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 26 he says, as, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death till He comes. Now, the participants would all get together and they would have the Lord's Supper. I know we do it on the first of every month, the first Sunday of the month. It doesn't say you know, do it on the first Sunday of the month. It just says, as often as you eat and drink of this bread, that's when you partake of the Lord's Supper. It, it, you can do it every week if you want to. You can do it every month if you want to. It's up to the church. 
That's why we're an independent fundamental Baptist church. We're, we're not governed by the church down the road or another church. We're, we're not, I don't have to answer to somebody else's church. We just choose to do it on the first of the month because we want to honor the Lord with our lives. Now, the participants in the proclamation. It's a proclamation is a visible reminder of what Christ did for us. He says, you do show forth the Lord's death till He come. There's three positions that people take concerning the Lord's Supper. But I believe it's important to know concerning, you know, the, the, the area that we have here, the Lutheran churches and the Methodist church, we ought to know uh, particularly why or what view we take concerning the Lord's Supper. One is called transubstantiation. It's the Catholic view of the Lord's Supper. These people say when the priest comes and, and they do the Lord's Supper and they hand out the, the elements there and he blesses the bread and the grape juice, they automatically become the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's not so. I don't practice cannibalism. I don't crucify the Lord afresh. As it doesn't literally become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I don't care who blesses it. And then there's a Lutheran view from what I understand is uh, where the bread and the cup of the juice uh, becomes the body and blood of Christ. You can correct me if I'm wrong later on. But it becomes the body and blood of Christ. And, and they believe that even though that you hold bread in your hand, it, there's part of the Lord's body in there somewhere along the line. It's a mis form of mysticism is what it is. And we don't believe that at all. What do we believe? We believe it's just a memorial. We believe it's a symbol of what the Lord, com Lord commanded us to do. When I get a picture, uh, when somebody has a funeral, and I see on the picture of this person and who they were, whether it's a man or a woman, we see the life that they lived, all their brothers and sisters going by, it's just a picture of who they were. And this is just a picture of our Lord and what He's done for us. And it's the position that our church takes. It pictures what Christ did on our behalf years ago. And so the two elements in the Lord's Supper, as you know, are the bread and the juice. A man by the name of Alfred Gibbs, he says this, and I want to quote him that way, it's not my words. It is interesting to note that there are practice among the Jews of gathering together in the home of a deceased friend to eat bread and to drink wine in his memory. And so when somebody would die, they said, that the Jews would get together and they would have bread and they would have wine together in memory of the person who's passed away and gone on. And so it was a practice in their day. And they quote Jeremiah 16 chapters, or verse 7 and 8. He says, Neither shall men tear themselves for them in mourning to comfort them for the dead. Neither shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or for their mother. Thou shalt not also go into the house of feasting to sit with them to eat or to drink. Now, whether that's so, I'm not that familiar with uh, history and these things, of the, whether that practice is actually so, but I, I believe that uh, it's a reputable author, and so I'll take him at, at his word there. And this says there's a picture found in the bread. In John chapter 12, verse 24, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die... It abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. The corn of wheat, it falls into the ground. And like you know, if you see an acorn tree or an apple tree, if that, if that fruit falls into the ground, what is it going to, it's going to produce other apple trees. It's going to produce other acorns. It's going to be much of them. You can't have one grain of wheat falls. You can't make bread out of one single grain. But the Lord gave His body, and, and when it was uh, went into the ground, the, the, the death... It brought up more, more and more and more and more of the wheat. And when they fall to the ground, as much wheat as it, I don't know how much wheat it takes to make a, a loaf of bread, but I'm sure it takes a lot. And so it represents his life that he gave that, that went into the ground and it was buried in the ground, but yet he rose again and it produced much fruit. I got saved because of the death of Christ. He produced fruit within my life. And I'm able to share the gospel with others and it produces fruit in their life and other lives and we're able to come together and partake of the Lord's Supper. This shows us that he had to take upon him the form of a man even though that he was fully God and fully man 
in order to give his life on the cross. You know, that, that piece of that, that grain of wheat that fell into the ground, it had to die to go into the ground. And, and if he was, he truly was God, but the only way that he could die is if he had a human body. And we know that the Lord had made for him a human body. He says, Lo, in the volume of the book that is written, written of me, I've come to do thy will, and a body has thou prepared for me. And it's in Hebrews. And it talks about how he was God clothed in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And it pictures uh, that taking place there. It shows the, his voluntary, very vicarious death on our behalf. And Jesus said, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down to myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. <laughs> Only God can do that. Only God can take up His life or lay it down. Well, he'll, He did that through Christ. And so it shows His voluntary. Just like the bread that's laid there on a plate and is, we're able to distribute from it. It was voluntary. It was given there for all to partake. It was given there for us. As the corn of wheat is grounded in order to make bread, our Lord was crushed and bruised for us, as it says in Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes, we are healed. With His stripes, we're healed. And I can't imagine what it's like to go through the, the mockery and ridicule that our Lord went through, through being, you, you've given your life and you've done many miracles and you've done all these things for, the, for, the, for everybody. Healing them, giving them their sight, giving them hearing. And you've given your life to minister unto others and yet they spit in your face. And yet they pluck out your beard and yet they, they say crucify him. I know Pilate said, I find no fault in this man, but they say crucify him, give us Barabbas. And he carries this old wooden cross up on top of a hill. And he was bruised and beaten and battered, the, the nail prints in his hands are a part of that. Of the blood dripping down to being grounded to powder, so to speak, in order to make the bread. He was bruised for our iniquities. Truly, bread corn is bruised and Christ went through the millstones of God's judgment for us. Christ has also suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us unto God. I can't suffer my own self and bring myself to God. I can't do anything to bring myself unto God. I can't work enough. I can't do enough. I can't help enough or show compassion enough to bring myself unto God. It had to be through Jesus Christ. And the picture is that unleavened bread. So when they were making bread back in those days, they weren't allowed to put yeast in it. It showed Christ's sinlessness. There was no, no sin in His body. There was no sin in His thoughts. There was no sin in His life like it is for you and me. If you followed me around and you were able to read some of my thoughts, you're like, you know, who are you to preach to me? Who are you to teach to me? I'm sure everybody, every man alive could say that. But Christ wasn't like that. Pure and unleavened, and yet He expects us to be pure and unleavened when we partake of the bread. Examine yourselves. And He was truly examined. He was, went through trial after trial, and He said, We find a fault within Him, and yet He was crucified on our behalf. And praise the Lord for what He did. And then the bread is baked in an oven. You take that bread, and you knead it, and you work it, and there's no leaven in it, but the only way that you want to make bread is just dough unless you put it into the oven. And it suffers that punishment, so to speak, that fire, that, that chastisement, that unseen chastisement. Pictures what He went through us when the Lord says, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? And we don't know what the Lord went through to suffer for the sins of the whole world. We can't imagine the, the pain and the suffering that He endured uh, from, from 9 o'clock into 3 o'clock, just bleeding and being ridiculed. and mocked. I can't imagine the suffering of the sins of the whole world that suffered on behalf of me. 
I, I mean, he suffered for you, but for me, why would you do that for me? Why would Jesus Christ, why would God do that for me? I don't know, but he did. There's a love that I don't understand. And so all the righteous judgment of sin fell on him. He suffered sins for the whole world. And his blood poured out. Then the picture found in the juice. As a grape is pressed, you know, they had many uh, wine presses in these days, and they would gather all the grapes, they would put them in that press, and I'm sure that they would trample around in them, and the juice would flow out. And it's a picture of that verse that says that without the shedding of blood is no remission. When his body was pressed down and the blood came out, and it was shed on the ground and it just kept pouring the cover for the sins of the whole world. It says a life is in the blood. That's why men weren't allowed to eat blood back in that day. He said, I want God, one of the ordinances he gave to the Israelites, he says, I don't want there to be any blood in your meat. I tell people that's the reason why my meat is well done all the time. I don't want to see blood in it. Uh, it's not really for that reason, but, uh, but he said life is in the blood. And then it represents the new covenant. Turn to Luke chapter 22. It represents the new covenant. Luke chapter 22, verse 20. It's also in some of the other passages, but I just wanted to use this one. Luke chapter 22, verse 20. And this is likewise... Also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Uh, Jesus Christ wasn't come to try to f keep going through the whole system of what they used to do of the ceremonial laws. Yes, He kept the law, every bit of it. But He came to do a, a whole new thing. And His blood is the cup of the New Testament. It's not the Old Testament where they would take the blood of bulls and goats to atone for sins and it would just wipe it away for a short time. It would just cover and just, uh, just put it away for a short amount of time and then you have to do another sacrifice and another sacrifice and another sacrifice. And, and they would take that blood and, and they would use it to purify the temple and use it to purify the mercy seat and purify uh, the priest and these things. I only needed one sacrifice, and that's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ when He gave Himself for us. He says, I didn't come to put new wine in old skins or else the skins would just burst. Says, I'm putting new wine in the new skins. I'm doing a whole new thing. So the sacrifices of the law could only atone, but they could not put away sins. And the blood of Jesus Christ, on the other hand, is seen as putting away sins. Hebrews chapter 10 Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4 says, But it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. And then in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26 it says, But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by sacrifice of himself. On the one hand the bulls and goats they tried to atone, but Christ put it away forever. And past, present, future, all of it put it away. No more remembered, it's no longer there when I accept them by faith so as to be done also until He comes. So we've seen the elements. We've seen that it's supposed to be done until He comes. We've seen the participants and what it means is symbolizing. But then the power here. The Lord's Supper shows us that it's a reminder of our past justification and what Christ did on our behalf of how He went to the cross and died for every one of my sins. He did it for me, not for I don't rely on my salvation from somebody else. Well, my parents got saved, and I'm relying on their salvation. No, I had to do it personally. And whenever I'd done that, in August 8, 2007, they, they, I took care of that as a reminder of what Christ did in the past. And then it's a source of our present sustenance. I still need Christ every single day, constantly, day in and day out. He's my sustenance. He's my life. And it pictures that. And then the pledge of our future blessedness and glory, he says, until I come, he's coming to t catch me away and to take me out of this world. And as we go and take of the Lord's Supper, I know it's a lot to cover there. 
as we partake of the Lord's Supper, what I want you to do in just these few minutes here is to examine yourselves. To think of what Christ has done for you and on, on your behalf. Uh, imagine Calvary. Imagine your, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the punishment He's paid for you and me. That's what I want you to do tonight as we conclude with a short invitation and get ready for the Lord's Supper. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for loving us and giving Yourself for us, Lord. I pray that uh, in all of this, Lord, we would give You glory and just uplift You and, and just rejoice in your, in your goodness, Lord. This is a time of joy. This is a time of, uh, of the love that You've shown us. This is a time of excitement, Lord. And we praise You for the Lord's Supper that we have a privilege to partake of, a privilege of being a part of your body. Lord, and sharing in that blood that you shed for us. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, if you